Please be seated. And right. And I want you to know it doesn't happen by accident. They work at it. They practice. They they're here for long hours on Thursday nights getting ready for Sunday mornings. And yeah, so they, they work hard. In fact, some of those songs we sang yesterday at Bill Maher's memorial service, for those of you who knew Bill, 18 months almost after he passed away, we were finally able to do a service with him and his family, and it was a sweet time to celebrate his life. So, hey, for those of you who have forgotten who I am, I'm Neil Davidson, all right? I know I haven't been up here in a while. Steve preached for the month of August. I wasn't goofing off. I was working, but just, just letting Steve use his gift and taking a little break, getting ready for what we're going to start today. But a couple first things first, right? So some of you think, you know, boy, the pastor looks a little dorky today, doesn't he? You know, he's dressed. And, and, but there is a rhyme and a reason for why this, right? Friday night, while eating a soft piece of food, I broke off a cap from my front tooth. Right? I br broke that tooth when I was a 10-year-old playing hockey on a pond out behind our house, stepped on some swamp grass, and so wear your mouth guard. There's a word for you right there. And... Um, and so I haven't been able to get to the dentist yet. So I figured I'd put on a bow tie and orange socks. <laughs> and then maybe you guys wouldn't be as distracted by my tooth as I go forward. And for, tho and, and for those who are listening online, you're definitely going to get the lisp from the tongue not hitting the front. So anyway, second thing. Some of you have been asking when we're going to go back to two services. And the answer to that question is when we need to. When we don't have room in one service, we're going to go back to two services. So I'm looking out this morning. When we have about 50 more people, we're going to look towards going back to services. We anticipate we'll probably do that sometime in October, but I don't have a, a, a specific date for you. But we will get that word out as actively as we can, and we will be going back to our 9 and 1030 format that we used to have before COVID hit us 18 months ago, right? So one last thing. Many of you read my column. One of my challenges to you was to make a new friend this quarter at Hope Chapel, between now and Thanksgiving, just to make one new good friend. Some of you already have lots of good friends, but my challenge to you is to make one new good friend. One of the, one of the greatest things we can offer people today in our environment is just to offer them community, offer them friendship. Loneliness is at a pandemic level in our society. And one of the greatest gifts of the people who've been commissioned to go out and love the world is to offer people friendship. So I want to give you some tips on how to make a new friend, right? So when you see somebody who's shaped like me, you know that they like food. So you say, hey, let's go, let's go grab an ice cream together or let's have lunch together or something like that. If their teeth are a little darkened, you know they like coffee, right? Say, hey, let's grab a coffee together, right? And if they're skinny, and wearing sneakers, you know they run a lot and you want to stay away from them, all right? <laughs> so lots of tips for you on how to do it. But you can look around. Anybody can do it. You can do this. So let's find a way <laughs> to get into it, all right? So hey, listen, let, seriously, we need to get into God's word. Let me just offer a brief prayer. God, thank you for the gift of laughter. You know, one of the things that you love to do is to order us, to command us to rejoice. And so we're grateful for the chance to laugh a little bit. But Father, we're also grateful that... Um, that you've just really, you want to speak into our lives. And what we're going to be talking about today in these next few weeks is just so critical to our journey with you. Father, you, you don't want to have anything less than just an absolutely incredible relationship with your people. And, and we need to do some work on our end. So give us wisdom as we figure out how to do that. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So Rick, I'm picking up a little... You got it covered? All right, good. So I just want to make sure I wasn't doing something wrong. You know, I find it absolutely amazing that you can summarize everything God has done, everything God wants to do, everything that God has given us and why he's given it to us. We can summarize God's will for our lives in two English words. And it's these words, be holy. You can take everything that God's done, right? The book of Ephesians, God speaking to us through the Apostle Paul. He says, God chose us before the foundations of the world, before time began, to be holy and blameless in him. 
God's agenda for us can be summarized simply with the words, be holy. In fact, you can summarize (laughs) why that's his demand for us in six words. He says, be holy because I am holy. Now, we first see those words in Leviticus chapter 19 and Leviticus 11 and chapter 20. But the Apostle Paul repeats those for us. Sorry, the Apostle Peter repeats those for us in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 16. You know, he's he's offering some guidance to these. And we're going to get back to a little context in a minute. He says, you know what? Just be holy. Because I am holy. It's God speaking to us. You know, I, I think sometimes today when we, we, we've kind of left this singular command kind of off to the side, we, we want to gravitate often as a church. You know, for those of you who've been around, what, what, what does God really want me to do? And we focus in on the great commandments. Nothing wrong with those. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? And love your neighbor as yourself. And those things sound a lot more, I don't know, be holy sounds a lot more intimidating, doesn't it? You know, and it doesn't sound near as much fun you know, as loving people. But at the, at, you know, or we want to gravitate to the Great Commission because we want to do something. We want to leave our mark on the world. So we want to go out and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them all. You know, we, we want to do something. And yet God challenges us at the very foundation. He simply says, be holy as I am holy. And this, this theme is, is something that the the Apostle Peter repeats to us. You know, it's interesting. We're, we're, our theme verse for the series we're going to go into today is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. And he says, listen, I'm writing to you. He starts out, dear friends. He's connected to these people. He says, dear friends, I'm writing to you a second time, meaning that I'm repeating myself, <laughs> right? You've heard this before, and I'm writing it again in the second letter. I'm repeating myself. Because it's easy to forget, you know, pandemics hit, unemployment comes, people get sick, I get sick. We have hurricanes that flood subways and knock down out. There's all kinds of life distractions. It's easy to forget. So I am, I'm telling you again, and I'm trying to stir you to a sincere understanding of faith by way of reminder. And so this series that we're going to walk into is, is called Stirred. For those of you who've been hanging around church for any length of time, we're probably not going to talk about very many things that you haven't ta- heard about before. Things like the Bible, things that like prayer, things like serving and giving and those kinds of things. We're, we're going to be talking about those things, but I want you to understand these things in context. You know, if you and I want to have a great walk with God, if you and I want to have a great relationship with God, we got to be walking the same path he is. Guess what path God's working, walking? Holiness. So he says, hey, listen, I, I want you right beside me, right? I, 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 want, I don't want there to be a, an, even an eighth of an inch of a separate. I want, I want us to be one. He says, you know what? And I'm holy. So I want you walking the path of holiness with me. That's why Peter says, you know, in, 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 sec- in his second letter to them, he says, listen, there's no doubt about what God wants for us, what the standard is for our holy conduct and righteousness. You know, he said, if we want to be walking with God, we've got to be walking the path of holiness. Now, we hear that kind of language, and, and I think we get intimidated and we say, you know what? That ain't going to happen for me. Right? You know, the last thing anybody's ever going to call, tell, call me when they're doing a memorial service for me is holy. Right? I mean, it just doesn't seem as like it's going to line up. I want to convince you from Second Peter that this is doable. And I also want you to see the pathway by which it begins to happen. And then we want to start looking at one of those today. So if you would, you can turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. For those of you who are using one of the Bibles underneath your seats, and for those of you who are at our Pleasant Street campus, there are Bibles now in the back of the chairs, some of the chairs there. And you're going to find your, the text, First and Second Peter. We're going to be jumping between the two. First Peter starts on page 1,075. 1,075. So it's way over towards the back of your Bibles. And First and Second Peter span about the next 10 pages or so. 
For those of you using your own Bible, if you get to the end, to the book of Revelation, and start flipping back a little bit, you're going to find your way through uh, Jude and 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. Those are pretty short books, and right away you're going to come to 1st and 2nd Peter. But I, I want you to listen to this passage of Scripture from 2nd Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. And, and if you're using your own Bible, there might be a couple things you want to underline. Now, again, this is the second time that Peter's written to them. He's already shared these same kind of thoughts before. He wants them to be reminded of this, so it gives them a kick in the fanny, or a nice way to say it, stirred, right? He wants to get them riled up to start moving towards walking with God, having a great relationship with God through walking the path of holiness. This is what he says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. He said, his divine power, and who can stop God's power? Nobody, right? His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory, and goodness. Just a little debrief there. You may want to underline the word everything, right? That's a powerful word, right? If you're right, it's the word everything. It's a, it, he's given us everything that we need. Now, our access to that is through our knowledge of him. That's through having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ through faith. Can't do this on your own. This is not something you're going to measure up to and achieve on your own. It comes as God grants to us a new life in Jesus Christ, when we recognize that we need a Savior, we know that Jesus is that Savior, and we place our faith in him. And when we do that, God pours into us everything that we need for life and godliness. Continuing on. By these, he's given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature. God wants you to become more and more like him Another way to put it, he wants you to have a great walk with him. He wants you to have a great spiritual life. So that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that's in the world because of evil's desires. For this very reason, because this is out there and available to us, this is what he says, I want you to say, I want you to make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, Goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, and endurance with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Now, I want to draw out a couple things to you just so they're just, just clearly obvious to us, right? Do we lack anything that would prevent us from being holy like he is holy if we are in Jesus Christ? The answer to that question is no, <laughs> right? He's given everything that we need for life and godliness. We can do this. We can. you got to believe it. You know, that your mind is going to be telling you one thing. Your experience is going to be telling you something else, right? Other people are going to be telling you through all kinds of stuff. And, and at the end of the day, we have to believe God's word. Because it's what's going to last true forever. And he says, you've got everything you need. You can have a great walk. You can have a great relationship with God. You can. You can. Right? Second thing. It's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen by accident. Look what, he, look what, what, look what Peter tells us. Listen, God, God's made these promises to you. Everything is available to you. So just sit down, put your feet up, relax, right? <laughs> what does he say? Make every effort, right? Roll up your sleeves, get to work, and do this stuff because this is what's out there that God's given to you as a gift. So make every effort to supplement, to work at it. <laughs> Here's the way I envision it, right? And so... Many of you, with the health insurance you get from your employer, you get a free gym membership. You, get, you have everything that you need to get in shape. You go to the gym, they got state-of-the-art equipment, right? They can make muscles hurt that you don't even know you have. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> right? And it's all there. All you have to do is go and use it. You just have to go in. You got to put the work in. You got to hit the treadmill. You got to do the You got to be with the crunches. And all. You got to do all that stuff. And believe it or not, over time, you're going to get in shape. This is exactly what God's saying to us. I've opened up the gin doors. And, and I have made available to you all the resources so that you can be holy and you can have a great relationship with me, right? Because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. You and I have actually got to get into the gym, <laughs> the spiritual gym, and use the stuff. Now, how many of you are like us, right? You've got a treadmill in your basement, and it's where you dry your clothes, Right? How, how many? Right? Come on, be honest, right? Just, you know, we, we, so God gives us, and then we don't do a whole lot with it. And, and I, and I want to use this series and embrace Peter's challenge. He says, man, I want to stir you up to a sincere understanding of the faith. And, and I'm going to tell you what you already know. I've told you what you already know over again so that you'll start taking next steps, making every effort to go forward. So that's why I've called this series Stirred, The Basics of a Great Walk with God. And so we're going to be bopping back and forth between First and Second Peter, and we'll bring in some other scriptures as we go along. But First and Second Peter is just eight chapters. But, but he, he, he hammers on all the things that you and I need to understand if we're really going to have a great relationship with God. Let, let's let's kind of do a little context here so we know who Peter is and what his connection is to these people. If you looked at 1 Peter chapter 1, you can see he's writing to a group of Jewish Christians who live outside of the promised land. They're in places like Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia, etc. So you really think more that they're like north and then spread out across the northern part of the Mediterranean and a little bit off to the east, right, from, from that area. The reason why they have such an attachment to Peter is because Peter was the voice that God used on the day of Pentecost. And, and as we go back and... and and we read in Acts chapter 2, Peter proclaiming the message when the gifts of the Holy Spirit have been given. So, and um, somebody has really an interesting phone. Wow. A, we still love you anyways. All right. So, so here's Peter. They're going to find it. There we go. Um, here's Peter. This is why I carry notes, all right? So when you, get, when you get out of sync, you can come right back, all right? It's okay. It's all going to happen to all of us at some point in time, right? So, so here's Peter. Peter is the first one to confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He's also the one who denied Jesus three times. And then when he saw Jesus on the seashore... After he was resurrected, man, he couldn't wait. He dove out of the boat and swam to the shore. So, and, and here's Peter on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes, and people are saying, these, these guys are drunk. These guys are, yeah. Well, yeah. He, he stands up, and he presents the gospel. And there are people in Jerusalem for the Passover who from every single one of these areas, Cappadocia, Bithynia, those kinds of areas, they're in all those spots. And so they look to Peter as their spiritual shepherd. And they're going through life. They've become believers. Life is getting a little harder, this and that, whatever. They're not really sure. About so they reach out to him and say, hey, man, you know, what, would you? And, and he's writing to them. So they, they have this affectionate relationship, and he wants nothing but the best for them. And, and right up front, he challenges them to be holy. If you go and you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, you get, you, you don't, he gets through some opening stuff and some great praises about what God's done in the past, present, and future with the good news of the gospel. And right out of the bat, the first thing he says to them, hey, listen, your conduct needs to be holy and blameless because as God said, be holy as I am holy. And, and he gets right after it for us. How do we do that? 
How do you and I get to a place? If we're going to work at being holy and having a great relationship with God, how do we work smartly? What should we work on? And here's the first thing I want to give you. Now, I'm 20 minutes into this, right? I'm finally getting to the first point. I will move along. The very first thing you have to do, and there is no substitute for this, no substitute, is you have to regularly read the Bible. Period. There is absolutely no substitute for regularly reading the Word of God if you're going to have a great relationship with God, if you're going to have a great walk with Jesus. There is no substitute, right? There just isn't. I know some of you are groaning like, oh, man, I hate to read, you know, and others are thinking, there's so many names in there I can't pronounce, you know, and then there's stuff that's confusing. I get all that, right? Let's work through some stuff together, right? Just, just keep, stay open-minded at least for another 15 minutes, all right? And, and let's work on some stuff. First of all, let me, let me substantiate my claim to you, right? Let me give you some good reasons why you should regularly read the Bible, why, why you should pick this up, right, and you should read it. And there are several verses I want to give you. The fir- first one comes from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. So again, if you're using one of our pew Bibles, this is on page 1079. I'd love for you to see it with your own eyes in black and white. It is going to show up on the screen behind me. But in verse 21, and let me start with verse 20, and then we'll get into verse 21. And it says, says, he says, above all, you know this. No prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation because no prophecy, in other words, no word spoken that became scripture. No, no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So here's what I want to say to you from this scripture. And we can bring in 2 Timothy chapter 3 where it says all scripture is inspired by God. You know, and it's profitable for correction and training and, and, and equipping in righteousness that the man, the man of God may be complete. Right? Here's the thing. The Bible is God speaking directly to you. If you want to know what it is that God's saying to you, you have to read the Bible. You have to read the Bible. It is God speaking to us directly. It wasn't man's words. God was speaking from, and these guys were carried along by the Spirit, as it says, right? And what they said, what they wrote down for us, what they pass on to us was directly what God was saying to us. Why is that important? Let me, let me one of the, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, he says, my sheep hear my voice and follow me. If you're going to hear Jesus' voice, you're going to hear it in the scriptures. The Bible is God speaking to us directly, right? And so we need to be reading it regularly. Here's the second truth I want you to see. The Bible is literally the source of our faith, right? The Bible is the source of our faith. This one's a kind of little interesting for us to pull together and get to and, and et cetera. One minute. First Peter chapter um, 1 verse 23. So we're going back a couple of pages now, right? Again, I'd love for you to put your own eyeballs on it. Verse 23. Again, let's put it in a little context. Start with verse 22. Since you've been purified, you purify yourself by obedience to the truth. What that really means is that you've acknowledged and accepted and committing yourself to following after Christ as your Savior and Lord. That's what it means to have obedience to the truth. It says, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly. And he goes on to say this, because you have been born again, right, our new life comes not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. God literally, literally uses his word to give life. 
He uses his word to give life. And, and where I connect, you know, over in Romans, it talks about the fact that, that how can they believe if they haven't heard? And how do they hear if somebody hasn't been sent to preach, right? And how, and how can somebody go and preach if they haven't been sent? But the whole context, when this messenger shows up, what are they going to be sharing? They're going to be sharing the word of God. I got to tell you, one of the things that, that it, it, you know, if you're looking for a church home and, and, and Hope Chapel isn't a good fit geographically or whatever, you need to be looking for a place where people are going to pick up the word of God and explain it to you. You don't want to be just listening to somebody else's opinion. And you don't want to be listening just to mine. You need to be listening to what God is saying from the word of God. For it's from here that we get life. It is the source, literally the source of our faith. Perfect example. Some of you are familiar with the story. Luke chapter 24, after Jesus has been resurrected, a couple of disciples are saying, all right, time to get out of the city, go back home. And they're making their way back to where they live, which is the little town of Emmaus. And what does the scripture say? That they're walking along with Jesus. They don't recognize who he is and et cetera. And when it finally becomes clear who he is, they say, weren't our hearts ablaze when he was speaking to us? Right? God's word has a way of creating faith and belief in us. It not only gives life, but it keeps giving life and grows our faith. It, it, it is actually the, literally the source of our faith. Third thing, it's indispensable for our spiritual growth. Indispensable for our spiritual growth. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse, um, verse 2. He says, like newborn infants. Got a couple of those here today. I got a granddaughter that fits this category. Like newborn infants, desire. I actually like the word crave better. Some of you go through and say, some of the translations use the word desire. Some say long for. Some say yearn for. Some say crave. Some say hunger, right? It says, crave the pure spiritual milk of the word so that you may grow in, into your salvation. The word of God is indispensable for the, our growth in faith, right? You know, this afternoon, we're going to head north, and I'm going to get to see my little granddaughter. And one of the things I love to do, and I've only got to do this a few times, is get to feed her. And so, some of you have had an experience. You put a bottle in their mouth, and they, they just can't suck it in fast enough, right? It's just dripping all over their chin and down, you know, that kind of, all that kind of good stuff. You know, and I, that's exactly the feeling. The desire, the urgency that we're supposed to have as we come to the Word of God. Man, you know what? If I don't have enough room in my day to spend some time reading the Word, I need to change my calendar because it's the most important thing I do. Right? It's that kind of idea. It's indispensable for our spiritual growth, right? It just absolutely is. The Bible also shows us how to live. It shows us how to live. If you go back over to 2 Peter, where we were just a minute ago in verse chapter 1, verse 19. It says, he says, so we have the prophetic word confirmed. In other words, God's already spoken to us. We know it's God's word. We have no doubt about that, right? He goes on to say this. He says, and you will do well to pay attention to it because it's like a lamp shining in a dark place until the dawn, day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. It's a, you know what, you and I are traveling through a dark world, and God's given us a headlight to use. And if you don't read the Bible, you're not turning your lights on. So imagine you're out trying to drive on a highway, and some of you, some of us have seen people like this coming up behind us or in front of us, right? It's dark out, right? And there's very little light, and they don't have their headlights on. And you're thinking, you know what, I'm going to slow down and let them get a mile ahead of me because they're going to hit something, right? Or I'm going to drive like a bandit so they're, they're, they're a mile behind me. That's really more my option, by the way. You know, and so I don't want them anywhere because, you know, they're going to hit something, right? And, or somebody's going to hit them. If you and I are trying to live life and walk with God through this journey and we're not using this, it's like being out on a, on a moonless, starless night when it's pitch black and we're trying to walk a trail and we got no flashlight. Because it is the lamp that God uses to give us direction. And, and I could elaborate on all that kind of stuff and just keep going and going and going. You know, 
you and I need to be reading the Word of God because it is God speaking to us, right? It, it is the source of our faith. It creates faith within us. It, 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 is, it is what nourishes our faith and grows us, and it gives us direction on how to actually live a holy life or to have a great relationship with God because God is holy, right? So straightforward. So let's get practical for a minute. Where do you start? And, and really what I want to say to you, someone's like, you know, all right, you know, I don't, I don't, first of all, if you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles for you, right? And in fact, I've got like 25 study Bibles in my office. You can just tap me on my shoulder. I'll be glad to give you one. You know what? You won't have to go to the gym because it weighs like 25 pounds and you can just use it at home and you can kill two birds with one stone. Right? So you, you may not, not even be familiar with it. Where do you start? And, and the first thing I'd really say to you is it really doesn't matter where you start. What's much more important is getting started. Now, hear that, hear, hear that up front. The most important thing you do is just get started. Just, just st now, listen, I would not point you towards Leviticus as where I want you to start reading. And for those of you who don't know why, you, you don't bother to look it up, right? It's just, there's all kinds of regulations about how big a bird has to be before it's uh, sacrificed and all that kind of stuff. All had very a great deal of significance spiritually, but that's not where you want to start. So just a couple suggestions and really just get started. But if you're brand new to the faith, I would tell you to either start in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or start in Genesis and Exodus. Because those are the chapters in the Bible where we see the people of God being formed up. And it's going to help you see what the formation is that goes on in your life. If you're looking for direction in your life, you know, you got choices to make. I, I would tell you, go look at some of the places like Proverbs, where you're going to get great nuggets about how to discern God's will and make decisions and how to live life. That's great stuff, right? And you can get some of that in, in James and some other places in the New Testament. If you've been walking in the faith, but you're, you just kind of know you're not on the path anymore, you're getting a little bit of a stray, here, I would tell you, some of the places to go read are like to go read in the, um, the prophets. And some of them can be tough, you know, but there's, you know, we have the major prophets and the minor prophets. And that's not because, you know, one's more important. It strictly has to do with the length of the books. Isaiah's got a whole lot more words in it than, you know, Malachi. And so one's called a major prophet, one's called a minor. You can go in there, and, and, it, and it is God speaking to his people is when they're off track. If you want to go to the New Testament, First and Second Corinthians would serve the same purpose, right? Uh, how to get back on track. What do I need to see? There's great places to start, right? But what I really want to tell you, how is it that you take what God said and glean it, harvest it, so that it actually creates this sense of holiness in your life? And I'm going to give you the exact same tip that I gave last year to you because I, I think it's eternally relevant. And, and all you have to do is remember the NSW method, right? The, sorry, did I say it right? WSN network. See, the bow tie is a little too tight. The blood is a little tight. The WSN thing. What does it say? So what does it mean? Now what am I going to do about it? So when you're reading the Bible, right, and you're, whether you've read just a couple of verses or you've read a whole chapter or you've read a section or whatever, just take a pause at the end and say, all right, wh what does it say? Then, so what does that mean for me? Now what am I going to do about it? Let me, just easy illustration, right, from, and this has really become one of my most uh, favorite verses, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, where it says, he who walks with the wise will be wise, but the companions of fools will suffer harm. Proverbs chapter 13, 20. Let me say it again. He who walks with the wise will be wise, but he who walks with fools will suffer harm, right? So what does it say, the W? It says those who, where we are headed in life is determined by those who are influencing us. That's what it says. Where we're headed in life is determined 
by those who are influencing us. That's what it says. If you walk with the wise, you're going to be wise. If you're walking with idiots, you're going to have the outcome that goes with idiots. You're going to suffer harm. So what does it mean? I need to be careful about who the mentors and the peers are who are in my life. That's what it means. I need to be careful about who I allow to influence me about the way I'm living my life. That's what it means. Now what are you going to do about it? Is there anybody in my relationship constellation who has a place of influence that I need to move down just a little bit or raise up a little bit? What does it say? So what does it mean? Now what am I going to do about it? WSN. Right? Powerful stuff. Not complicated, but it's powerful. Listen, God, God has given us the Holy Spirit. He's going to help guide us into all truth and into light, whatever. You're going to figure this out. You just got to sit before the Lord, listen, read his word, let him speak, and glean it for yourself. God's going to help you in all that journey. He is. And, and I, I want to challenge you, if you're not already reading the Bible, to start doing so. Just start reading the Bible. And so, well, again. Just some, there's a few resources that are going to pop up up in the screen. For some of you, you know, you just want to figure out a little bit more about the Bible. You know, the Bible's written by numerous authors over a thousand year span. One of the places where you can go and get some great overviews and see some things and learn some truth is a site on YouTube called the BibleProject.com. And, uh, and so you see it right, right now, BibleProject.com. Pretty simple, straightforward, some good stuff. They're going to give you background information on any particular book that you're reading. They'll even give you background in the Old Testament, New Testament, sections of the Old and New, all that kind of stuff. Great resource in there. So if you're just trying to get more familiar, or let me say it this way, you're trying to get more confident that you can really trust this, good resource. Just for just reading, BibleGateway.com. BibleGateway.com. They also have a, an app and some other stuff. But, you know, so let's just say right now you're struggling with loneliness. I mean, that's what we're trying to eradicate in our fellowship, right, by really working on community this month. You can just go there and you can type into their search engine the word loneliness. And it's going to bring up a lot of passages that are going to speak to that. And God can use those. And he will. May, you know, and maybe it's about forgiveness, and you can just go right on down the line. There's a lot of things that will pop up. A great resource to you. I've also put together, and I, no, that's, that would not be a, a correct statement. There, for those of you who are ready to take a little bigger bite of the elephant, we came across a 90-day reading plan that's going to give you a pretty thorough panorama of the scriptures. And what I mean by that, you're going to be reading over a 90-day period. You set it aside by 30, 30 minutes a day. Probably going to take you a little longer if you're a slow reader like me. And it's, and it's about 10 chapters a day. But over 90 days, you're going to read about 900 chapters from cover to cover in the Scriptures. And it's going to give you a wonderful panorama of what God has, has showed us in His Scriptures. And we have paper copies of this out in the lobby and, and they're available for you. You can get it off of our website. Right on our front page, there's a place in there that, that for the 90-day reading plan. You can just download. And you know what? It's okay if you make it 180 days. All right? Just don't tell anybody. No, I'm just kidding. I mean, just the bigger thing, get in the Word and start reading. Listen, listen, God longs to have a great relationship with us. It, 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 before time began, God's purpose was for us to be holy so we could stand directly next to him. And he has given everything that we need for that life and godliness. And he's just saying, come take it. Come take it. And my challenge and invitation to you today is take it from God's word. Because it will grow your faith. It will change who you are. It will shape your conduct, and it will lead to having a great relationship with God. Let's pray together for just a minute. God, we're grateful for your word today.
know, every single one of us sitting in this room today is thinking, you know what, I, I, I need to do something with this. Father, I, I pray that, that we would not have any sense of real contentment and rest till we figure out what we're going to do with it. Let your spirit keep speaking to us so that we truly, individually and collectively, can be said that we have a great relationship with you because we are people of the word. For this we pray in the name of the one who came as a fulfillment of your promises to us and the keeper of the promises for us. 